I am a tropical ecologist by training. My research has always been focused on the geographic region of Southeast Asia. Now, part of understanding biodiversity impacts in this region involves studying species of conservation concern, such as orangutans. We need to keep track of how many orangutans there are, where they live, and how their population and distribution change over time. Now, the traditional way of monitoring orangutans is to hike through the forest and to spot and count uh, orangutan nests. Some have tried using helicopters or ultralight aircraft to do that from above the forest canopy, but that can be very expensive and risky. So several years ago, a few of us took it a step further and tried to use a toy plane to look for these orangutan nests from the air. Now this is an early prototype we built almost 10 years ago now. Although it was just a prototype, it was already quite a sophisticated device. It had an autopilot system, a GPS, a compass, and a couple of other sensors. When we brought our DIY drone to our field site for test flights, we were surprised at how well it uh, performed, considering how it was put together, literally just with some glue and tape. For the first time, we were able to get a bird's eye view of the landscape without the high cost of hiring a manned aircraft. And that immediately opened up many new possibilities. And because we were the first ecologists to build and use this technology for conservation, we quickly became swamped with requests from our colleagues around the world to help them use this technology for their own applications. And so over the subsequent few years, we started a nonprofit called conservationdrums.org and traveled around the world to help these colleagues who were typically from environmental NGOs, universities, and government agencies. And they, of course, became our partners as we discover more and more users for this technology together. What I want to share with you today are some of the lessons we learned in terms of the promises and pitfalls of adopting a new technology such as drones for conservation. I would say there are three main promising applications of drone technology for conservation. These are the enforcement of protected areas, the mapping and monitoring of habitats, and the survey of wildlife. Let's start with enforcement. This is a protected forest in North Sumatra. It is part of an ecologically important ecosystem called the Gunung Luso National Park. We collaborated with a local NGO in Medan and trained them to use our drones for surveilling parts of this protected area. Now, they quickly became very proficient drone operators and were able to conduct regular surveillance flights over the forest uh, to take pictures like this one. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, they detected very clear evidence of illegal logging. Now, if you look carefully at this picture, you can see that the people responsible for this logging were smart enough to leave a strip of forest along the river bank as a way to hide the crime scene from the river traffic. So if not for their drone flying overhead, this logging would not have been easily detected. The second most common application we encountered was mapping. I would say that mapping is also the most successful type of drone application. Here, we were invited by the Forestry Department of New Caledonia to show them how drones could be used for uh, monitoring their reforestation efforts. So a drone is basically just a flying camera. Uh, a typical mapping mission involves programming the drone to fly over a forest like this uh, and to take hundreds and thousands of pictures from the air. And these images can then be processed to produce not only maps of the area, but also 3D models of the forest. Uh, what you see here is actually a digital reconstruction of a dry forest in New Caledonia. The 3D model also enables us to estimate the height, shape, and volume of the trees and together these data allow us to keep track of reforestation efforts. Apart from mapping and monitoring habitats, drones are also useful for studying the animals that are living in those habitats.
Now, as I mentioned earlier, the whole idea of building and using drones came out of the need to survey orangutans in the wild. After some trial and error, we managed to come up with a successful solution, and this is how we do it. We will first program our drone to fly a zigzag pattern over the forest, capturing images of the forest canopy. We will then process those images into linear transects, like what you see here. And because these are very high resolution images, we are able to spot and count the orangutan nests by carefully combing through the images or by training a machine learning algorithm to help us do so. This is another interesting example. Each gray blob you see here is actually a colony of hundreds of thousands of royal penguins. These penguins are endemic to Macquarie Island and two other smaller islands nearby. Now, nobody really knows how many royal penguins there are because the conventional way to survey these colonies is to go up in the air in a helicopter with a pair of binoculars and just eyeball the size of each colony. One of my former PhD students, Jared Hodgson, brought a drone with him to the island, flew it over the colonies, and was able to capture images like this. Now, these images are a permanent record of the colonies, which enabled him to count the penguins more accurately and keep track of how these colonies change over time. And of course, machine learning algorithms can be developed to do the counting more efficiently as well. So far, I've been talking about some of the most promising applications of drone technology. Now, in the next few slides, I will talk about some of the pitfalls and challenges of this technology. The first point is about fit for purpose. When people come to me for advice on using drones, I usually ask them what the scale of their problem is. And this is probably the largest landscape we have mapped using a drone. It is a 15,000 hectare oil palm landscape in Borneo. It took the team several weeks to do it, and with the help of staff from the oil palm plantation. In retrospect, it would have been much quicker and perhaps even cheaper to do it using a small aircraft. So it is really important to understand that drone technology is useful for some and maybe even many, but not every application. A second consideration is the environment. For many field ecologists, uh, the reason why we want to use a drone is because we work in very challenging environments. Sometimes it is difficult to even get to our field sites. This is a picture taken by one of my former students, Susanna, who brought a drone with her to Madagascar for field work. And as you can see, it was quite a perilous journey. Her truck had to go on a makeshift floating platform to cross this river, and her drone was actually hiding somewhere among her many other equipment on the roof of this truck. And this is Susanna uh, during her fieldwork in Madagascar again to map the vegetation in her field sites. It was a very hilly terrain, and at the end of the trip, the drone was completely destroyed, and she donated what was left of it to a local village and made some kids very happy. So it is important to anticipate these environmental challenges and adapt and prepare for them as much as possible before getting to the field. The next issue is about the delivery of this technology. And more specifically, the last mile delivery of the technology. Now, ultimately, what we hope to achieve is to transfer this technology to the local communities for them to own it and use it effectively. In some cases, we find that it is really challenging for local communities to take up this technology for a variety of reasons. For example, language is a common barrier, so we often have to use a translator. Infrastructure is another problem, because in many rural areas, internet access may be slow or non-existent. And sometimes the community may not be comfortable with technology. But in general, as the technology becomes more mainstream over the years, they also become more user friendly. And that lowers the entry bar quite a bit. The fourth concern is about animal welfare and ethics. 
Nowadays, it's quite common uh, for us to see pretty pictures and amazing videos of wildlife taking, taken using drones. And I think it's generally a good thing that this technology is bringing us closer to nature, sometimes quite literally. But on the other hand, some of us have become quite concerned about how this technology might be affecting these animals. Because even if the drones are not in physical contact with the animals, the animals may still be disturbed and stressed out from the noise and movement of the drone. And this is particularly concerning in animals that are breeding. Will the increase in stress levels cause the parents to abort their pregnancies or abandon their eggs? How will the drone affect the survivability of their young? The scientific community doesn't really know, so, so it is really important for researchers to try and understand how wildlife uh, are being affected by drones. The last challenge is about the quality of data collected using a drone. Remember the royal penguins on Macquarie Island that I talked about earlier? This is Jared Hodgson, my former student who did that work. I mentioned how Jared was able to estimate the size of uh, these penguin colonies from his drone images. But can we really trust Jared's estimates? How repeatable and reproducible are his estimates? And how reliable is this technique in general? To answer those questions, Jared designed a bird counting competition between experienced bird watchers and drones. It was a very clever experiment. Uh, Jared created multiple colonies of different but known numbers of plastic ducks on a beach in South Australia. In one corner, we had the humans with their expensive binos and telescopes. In the other corner, we had the drone pilots flying drones over these colonies to take aerial pictures, which were processed using a machine learning algorithm to count the birds in real time. At the end of the study, Jared was able to show conclusively that drones did a much better job of producing higher quality data with greater precision and accuracy than the humans. So to recap what we've learned today, drones can be a very useful technology for conservation research and applications, especially to help in the enforcement of protected areas, the mapping and monitoring of habitats, and the survey of wildlife populations. But to fully realize the potential of this technology, we need to be aware of a few challenges. We need to ensure that we are using the technology for the appropriate purpose, we must understand and adapt to the environmental conditions where it would be used. If we are transferring the technology to local communities, we need to be aware of the potential barriers and find ways to overcome them. If we are using our drones near wildlife, we need to be aware of any disturbance or distress we might be causing to these animals and take steps to, to minimize these negative impacts. Finally, as scientists, our job is to maintain high standards in the quality of our data and science. So it's always good to remind ourselves that the uh, technology is just a means to an end and not the end itself. Our end goal has always been to produce robust data and information to help guide policies and decisions in society. And with that, I thank you for your attention.